Most Honorable Kenneth Hall and the Most Honorable Mrs. Rima Holding Hall. Honorable Ministers of Government, President of the Senate, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Archbishop Lawrence Burke, ladies and gentlemen, students. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2006 Grace Kennedy Foundation Lecture, the 18th since the inception of the series in 1989. First, I must extend apologies on behalf of Mr. Douglas Arena, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Grace Kennedy, who is unable to be with us this afternoon because of a previous commitment overseas. We are particularly delighted that their excellencies, the Most Honorable Professor Kenneth Hall and Mrs. Hall, have honored us by attending this lecture. We are happy that so many representatives from children's organizations have found it possible to be here as we explore an issue that is of such deep concern to us all. Over the years, we have managed to rely on the attendance and participation of our secondary and tertiary students, their teachers and lecturers. Many of you have traveled many miles into Kingston this evening, and we feel privileged by the effort you have all made to be here with us. We have noted that over the years, the composition of our audience becomes more diverse as more and more people from all walks of life come to share with us. It is with justifiable pride that we have watched the Most Honorable Professor Kenneth Hall, Her Excellency Mrs. Rima Hall, Ministers of Government, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests. First, I would like to thank the Grace Kennedy Foundation for the opportunity to share with you facts about Jamaica's children, where we are, and where we need to be. When one hears the title of this lecture, Children Caught in the Crossfire, and particularly as a result of the recent events in our country, where children have been murdered in the last few weeks, one might have expected this lecture to be dedicated only to a discussion of violence against children, but it's not. It's not because violence against children is an end point, not a beginning. It is an end point of a society that has placed children in crossfires of different types over time. Only by serious and comprehensive study of the lives of Jamaican children, the families in which they live, and the environment in which they grow, can we understand the challenges of childhood. And only then will we be able to identify what we need to do to impact the future of our children. I therefore invite you to journey with me through the challenges of a Jamaican childhood as we seek to answer the questions. How did we get here? And research the history of childhood. Where are we now as we look at the challenges of childhood and the responses of children? And where should we be going as we use the information to look at the solutions? First, I will begin by giving some facts on human childhood. Mammals, of which humans are the highest, are the most caring parents in the natural world. Indeed, the success of mammals in the animal kingdom is believed to be due to their care of the young. The period of care and nurturing in humans, known as childhood, is a quarter of the average lifespan of 75 years. There is no other species in which a period of caring takes so long. Early history, however, has largely ignored children. In fact, it only paid attention to adults of royal blood. The most comprehensive works of childhood history are those reporting on Western civilizations, and it is instructive for us to review this. Prior to the 1960s, when Philip Aries published a seminal work on the history of childhood in France, there were no inquiries at all into the history of childhood. Aries suggested that childhood as we now know it, a recognizable period of human development during which special care and attention is needed, did not exist prior to medieval times and was discovered first in the 16th century. To support his arguments, he identified writings which suggested that children should not be counted, and he showed art which showed children with a body habitus of little adults. In the 16th century, however, he noted that things changed. Persons first began to speak about coddling of children. 
but there was still a period of differences. The two writings in the same era illustrate this. First, there is someone who, who writes, I cannot abide that passion for care caressing newborn children, which have neither mental abilities nor recognizable bodily shape to make themselves lovable. But as the coddling became more and more prominent, someone else wrote, a few words of cordiality and trust make an impression on their minds. Though many did not agree with Aries, what he did was to start the research into the history of childhood. Later, Shahar said, identified three stages of childhood in the 14th century paintings of the seven stages of man. Infantia lasted from birth to seven years, and during this period there was perfection of walking, teething, and speech. Purisha lasted from seven to 12 years in girls, and from seven to 14 years in boys. This period were considered impressionable, immodest, carefree, moody, to crave food, sleep, and the attention of their pairs. however, and again nothing has changed, was believed to begin at 14, but nobody quite knew where it ended. There were periods of 21 years, 25 years, and even 35 years. Still, I believe nothing has changed. <laughs> Demos in 1974 gave the most stark representation of childhood. He wrote, the history of childhood is a nightmare from which we have only recently begun to awaken. The further back in history one goes, the lower the level of childcare, and the more likely children are to be killed, abandoned, beaten, and sexually abused. He identified six stages of parent-child interaction as they emerge throughout history. And I'm going to spend a little time on this to show you how, how recently it is that we have really started paying attention to children. Infanticide was very common from antiquity to the 4th century, and was supported by prominent persons such as Aristotle. It was used to control family size, to remove disability from a community, and to appease gods. Not until AD 374 was infant infanticide regarded as murder. When it was, it was quickly replaced by abandonment. There was permanent abandonment, and there was temporary abandonment. Permanent abandonment occurred when children were exposed. They were left on street corners and in the woods. Some were taken by families who wanted children, and others died. This was the beginning of foundling homes, when the church opened homes where people could leave children with anonymity being maintained. Some persons left little tokens so that if life got better for them, they would be able to reclaim their child later on. The mortality rate, however, in these homes was high. Many children died. Other children were sold as slaves. But there was also temporary abandonment among the wealthy. Children were sent away from their homes to be wet nursed for periods of two to five years because both mother and father considered nursing degrading and disgusting. When children were sent away, the mortality was quite high. They were sent to poor rural communities and the mortality was high, but the practice still continued. In the ambivalent period, children first became a part of parents' lives, and paintings first began to show children at the feet of their parents. But they were considered beings that needed molding. They were swaddled and wrapped to prevent them from hurting themselves, but they were also, it was also to prevent them from animalistic behavior, such as crawling. Children were beaten, they were given enemas to remove evil material from them, and they were also sexually abused. The intrusive period saw the first major change between parent-child relationships. Children were first considered then to be less threatening to others and less dangerous to themselves. <coughs> Parents became closer to children, but they tried to control their behavior by controlling their minds. Children were now nursed. They were hit regularly, but they weren't beaten mercilessly. They were prayed with, but they were not played with. This was also the time of the Industrial Revolution, when child labor was necessary. Persons moved into cities and created the modern phenomenon that we now know as street children. Indeed, it was the presence of street children that led to public schooling being commenced because the street children had high levels of antisocial behavior because of their unstructured free time. In the socialization period, 
children were first regarded as a resource to be cherished and celebrated. In Europe, this first began in the middle class, but public schooling and child labor laws allowed the belief to move through the rest of society. Freud's theories developed and the child psychology began. This is followed by the helping mode. In the helping mode, parents now spend time with children, explaining their questions, talking with them, particularly the children under six years, and responding to their needs. The most noted that this, this pattern of behavior was not necessarily the same in other cult cultures. So we went, next slide, to look at childhood in Africa. Because Africa has an oral tradition, there is very little written. And what is written um, in the very early years is so racist that it does not, it, it is not warranted really. Yeah. But the first real work on childhood in Africa was done by, and I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not very good at French, so May Sue, in the 1980s. He noted that African children were on the lowest rung of an age-dominated society and were valued mainly for obedient work in family and communities. Infanticide was practiced, but there were rights for infant survival because children died from infectious diseases so early. In comparison to what was happening in Europe, skin contact was encouraged and breastfeeding occurred. However, there was sudden weaning of children, and once children were weaned, they were expected to contribute to the domestic life of the home, and they were under the instruction of older children. Rites of passage signal the end of childhood. That occurred in different countries between the ages of 12 and 18 years. These rites of passage included temporary seclusion, body incisions and tattoos, cutting of genitalia, or celebratory feasts. Now what about a history of our own childhood, a childhood in Jamaica? This has not been researched in detail. However, there is some information that is available. In order to look at what has been happening to children in Jamaica, a review was done of legislation and a review of newspapers. Both international treaties and actual laws were looked at, and they were separated into those laws that occurred pre-1962, pre-independence. Laws before the laws in the 19 in the 1800s did not make any specific reference to children. The first specific reference to children was in the Geneva Declaration of the Rights of the Child. This first recognized special care that was necessary for children. And there were five principles. Children should be given the means to attain normal development. Nutrition and health care should be given to orphans and children with special learning needs. They should be the first to obtain relief in distress situations. They should be put in a position to earn a likelihood. And finally, they should be taught that their talents were to be used to help their fellow man. When one looks at the laws, one can see that what was actually happening until 1959 with the Declaration of the Rights of the Child was really about care and custody of children. The Declaration of the Rights of the Child in 1959, which was put forward by the United Nations and which followed the Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, added social needs to children's needs. It included the fact that the child should have a name and nationality, nutrition, good housing, education, and protection. Next slide. Post-1962, after the Education Act in 1965, we saw a flurry of laws in the 1970s. The Status of Children Act gave status to all children in the country. In 1979, we celebrated the International Year of the Child. The International Year of the Child was to mark 20 years since the Declaration of the Rights of the Child. In 1989, 30 years after the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, the United Nations uh, put 